So as I said, the, the idea of this uh, webinar was just to give people a, a general overview of um, what high performance computing is, in particular what the Archer service is, but also I wanted to, to um, tell people about our MSc programs in high performance computing. I don't expect, I expect I should be talking for about 30 minutes and then we'll be open for questions. Um, but I need to finish just before six, but I don't think it'll go on that long. So I just wanted to really say, first of all, what EPCC was, um, very briefly, what is high performance computing and what is Archer. Uh, and then I'll talk about the MSC programs at the end, and hopefully it'll be obvious how they how they link together. So EPCC, um, well, EPCC is actually just EPCC, but the original uh, term was Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre. It's obvious where the acronym came from, and I'll try to explain a bit what parallel computing is in, in this talk. Um, we're an institute in the School of Physics and Astronomy, a bit like a department, part of the University of Edinburgh. Um, and we consider ourselves the UK's leading supercomputer centre. And in particular, we run um, the machine you can see there, uh, which, is, which is Archer. And I'll explain how that works and how that fits into what we do. So just very briefly, what is high performance computing? And I'll come back to this later. But the important point is in, in science and industry, um, a lot of problems are insoluble via um, standard means, a standard means meaning maybe 10, 20 years ago, pencil and paper. The problems are just too difficult, and I'll, um, I will uh, address this more directly in a few slides. But for example, I've got two examples here. I've got simulating the Earth's oceans. You want to simulate that there's a temperature of the Earth's oceans globally across the whole ocean. It's an enormous calculation. You need a lot of computing power to do that. And on the right, there's a picture of ITER, which is going to be the new um, fusion reactor being built in Cadarache in France. And hopefully, it'll be the first fusion reactor to actually generate more power than it consumes. Um, but of course, it's going to cost billions of euros to build. And when you switch it on, you want it to work. And so an enormous amount of effort has gone into simulating that. And again, to simulate that on a computer numerically requires enormous computing power. And the number of problems that can be tackled is growing. So high performance computing, the techniques we use are required to use all today's supercomputers. And the re what, what is a supercomputer? Well, modern supercomputers are different from, slightly different from normal computers. They're all parallel machines. So I'll explain what a parallel machine is. So if you look at the dictionary, this is actually a definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. Serial computing, which is a standard what you do when you write a normal program. You write a program, you compile it, and you run it. It's running a single task. So I write a program, I run it, and it runs using one, one of my processors or one processor on my computer. Parallel computing is a mode of operation in which a process is split into many parts which are executed simultaneously on different processes attached to the same computer. So we can see there are two components here. We as the programmer have to split the, um, the um, process, what, what we want to do, into many parts. And then we have to find a computer which has lots of processors so we can run the different parts on different processors. And by doing that, we can, we can make the the, the, the um, program go faster. If I can split a process or, or, or a problem into four parts and run them simultaneously on four different processors, four different computers, I can hope to run the program four times faster. And that's what we do in high performance computing. So the first part is, well, I've said you need, if you look at that definition, you need to have uh, a, a computer which has many processors. Well, it turns out that today, Parallel computers have many CPU cores, many CPUs. There's a bit of confusion in the terminology. But, um, and my laptop that I'm running this presentation on has two cores, two CPUs. A desktop, which might sit under your desk, might have four CPUs. The PlayStation 3, depending on how you count it, has about nine CPUs. Uh, if you have a departmental cluster machine serving your local, um, your, your, your local um, um, computing needs in your department in the university, it might have about 200 CPUs. Archer in the bottom right, if you count them all, has 118,080 processor cores. So an enormous number of processors. But there's two things to take out of this slide. First is that modern supercomputers get their power by having large numbers of processors. The processors themselves aren't actually particularly different. We have hundreds of thousands of them. But secondly, all, all, all computers nowadays are parallel computers. So although on the uh, and when I come to the MSC, we, we concentrate on how you program very big machines. 
if you can program a machine like Arch and run on hun tens, hundreds of thousands of processors, it means you can you can program a PlayStation or a cluster or, or even your laptop more efficiently. You can use all the processors at the same time. So that's how I get my parallel computer. I can buy a big expensive one like Arch or I can use my laptop which might have multiple cores. But how do I program these? And I'm going to go through this very briefly, but there are two main approaches. One is called distributed memory programming. And what you do is you run many processes, which are separate programs. And the extreme cases on Archer, you could run up to 118,080 individual programs. And they'd all run on a different processor, a different processor core of Archer. But obviously, we want them to, to communicate with each other, to talk to each other. There's no, pro there's no point having 118,080 programs doing their own thing. And they communicate by something called message passing. And effectively, that's like every processor sending every other processor an email. It's a good analogy. These processors are working on their own. And when they want to talk to each other, they effectively send and receive emails. And that's called message passing. The other programming model is called shared memory. Here's a slight technical definition. You run many threads, um, but they all belong to the same program. So technically, we write one program, and they launch many threads. And an extreme case of this is actually this is how graphical processors work. If you have something like an Xbox or a PlayStation or even a high-end PC or laptop, it will have a GPU, a graphical processor. And they, they work by having thousands of threads. So a, a modern game will launch up. It's probably one process, but it will launch thousands of threads to do the graphical rendering. And these communicate by reading, reading and writing to shared memory. They can actually share memory, share memory with each other, which, which in the, uh, the other model we can't. And, and there's some subtleties to do with that. But again, the same techniques which we use on supercomputers are also used on laptops, desktops, clusters, or even, as I've said here, graphical processors. So uh, parallel computing high performance computing and parallel computing is, is universal in the sense that it applies to, to all levels of computing. It may be absolutely critical if you've got 100,000 processors in a national supercomputer like Archer, but it's, a very, it's, it's becoming a more critical technique even for programming your laptop. Your laptop has got two or four processors. Wouldn't it be nice to run a program that used them all? And, and these kind of techniques are, are applicable there. You might ask, who needs all this power? Well. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that um, high performance computing involves two communities, really. There's a community called computational scientists, and these are people who are maybe engineers, physicists, chemists, mathematicians, <coughs> excuse me, who want to do big numerical experiments. And I'll, I'll come back to them on the next slide. But as I said, engineers, physicists, chemists, people doing material, material science, people predicting the weather, people doing climate research, and people doing large scale data analysis want to run very large programs, big. What effectively numerical experiments, not physical experiments, not paper and pencil calculations, but large numerical experiments where they write a computer program to simulate tomorrow's weather. When you switch on the TV and you see a weather forecast for tomorrow, that has been generated by a very large parallel program running on, on a dedicated parallel supercomputer down at the UK Met Office in, in the south of England. However, the other communities are important for high performance computing are computer scientists who work on enabling um, people to use parallel computers. So they develop new parallel programming languages and libraries. They might develop new algorithms, new ways of using parallel programming, new compilers and new tools. Or they might say, you might come to them and say, look, I've got this parallel program, but it doesn't run very fast. The computer science community can go away and optimize that. And in fact, that's why high performance computing is very exciting. I think that it brings together two communities, people who develop new techniques, and people use those techniques together. They work very closely with each other. And in fact, we, our MSc programs appeal to both communities. Typically, in any year, we have about the same number of students coming from mathematics, physics, engineering backgrounds as we do coming from computer science, informatics backgrounds. So there's a, a coming together there. Um, so what is computational science? Well, in the old days, um, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, what you did if you were a scientist is you came up with a theory. And here's a picture of Peter Higgs, who's very, very famous at Edinburgh because he, he won the Nobel Prize recently. And Peter came up with his theory, which predicted the um, existence of the Higgs boson. And then you know, 30, 40 years later, we designed an experiment, the Large Hadron Collider. 
And this was the way that science was done, although this is a modern example, was done for, for, for many decades, that you came up with a theory, you tested it with an experiment, and then you refined your theory. There was this circle. The problem is, for sort of reasons I'll explain on the next slide, it's often not possible to predict from your theory what the, what the result should be, or it might not be possible to do the experiment. So nowadays what happens is, is the third step, which is computer simulation. So long before the Higgs boson was discovered, there were computer um, simulations being run to say, well, you know, if, we're gonna, if we did produce the Higgs boson, how could we de design these enormous detectors to, to detect it? And so what the cycle now is, is you come up with a theory to get predictions from that theory, you run a computer simulation, which you then check with experiment, and then you refine the theory. But computer simulation is, is in there in the loop. Um, and it's becoming fundamental to, to, to huge, any large-scale calculation, any, any challenging problem in science nowadays, at some stage, probably uses computer simulation. And if you've got a complicated problem, you need lots of uh, processing power, which means you need to use a supercomputer, which, as I said, has lots of processors, so you need to know about parallel programming. So, so the, just briefly, why, why can't we do the old thing of just have our theory sit down with a pencil and paper and work out the answer. Well, for ex the theory might be too complicated. This equation, I think it's uh, from fluid dynamics, is a very challenging equation. <laughs> wouldn't like to try and solve that with a pencil and paper. So it can just be too difficult to do. Or it might be too expensive. If you want to design a car and you want to make sure your car is roadworthy and passes crash safety tests, that's a very expensive experiment to do. You only want to do it once or twice. So you want to prove on a computer that, that your car is roadworthy. So you then only have to do the experiment once. So this could be save lots of money. Um, it might be just impossible if you want to predict when the next um, when a, um, a volcano is going to erupt, you just cannot go into the center of a volcano and make the measurements. You can't do the experiment. So we have to write computer simulations which simulate, in this case, how the magma um, evolves. It might be too big. If we want to say, well, imagine we cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 50%, 80%. What will the weather, what will the climate be in 50 years' time? We can't do that experiment on the Earth. The only thing we can do is, is, is write a sophisticated numerical um, a, a program which to simulate the climate, and then we can do what-if scenarios. What will the weather be like, the climate be like in 100 years if, if, if greenhouse gas emissions are at a certain level? It could be too small. So this, the, the, we might be looking at the structure of an atom, or even inside an atom, the structure of the nucleus. We simply can't look at that detail, so we can only do that uh, experiment with, with a computer. Or it might just be too far away or too, to take too long. I might ask, what happens when two galaxies collide? I look up in the night sky and I find two galaxies colliding here. I'm going to have to wait a billion years for that to happen. And so if you're going to simulate the cosmos, simulate the evolution of the, the universe, you need to, to do it on a computer. And you can condense billions of years into, into hours if you have sufficient computer power. So that's trying to motivate what parallel computing is, what parallel computers are, what people try and do on them. Just in a nutshell, Archer is the UK National Supercomputing Service. So if you do any um, research in engineering or physical sciences or biology or, um, or, or the natural environment, um, you would typically apply for time on Archer. And it's, they're, these are big computers. So Archer is a more than 40 million pounds over four years or run until at least 2017. I put the hardware on here, it doesn't matter if you're not a hardware expert, but really this is just to say that the actual hardware is standard Intel. You may have heard of Intel, a big chip manufacturer. Um, Archer is made from standard Intel chips, but rather than having one or two of them, we have actually, um, depending on how you count, but we have about um, 10,000 of these, which gives us about over 100, almost 120,000 individual cores. So, this is a Cray machine, Archer is a Cray machine, a Cray parallel computer. You might say, well, wait a second, you've bought this computer from Cray for 40 million pounds. All they've done is given you lots of Intel chips. You could have bought them yourself. Well, what you can't do is join them together. So the expertise that a supercomputer manufacturer like Cray brings together is how to link these together. And they design their own networks, and, and they have a thing called the Dragonfly Interconnect, which is on the, on the Cray machine. And I'll have an illustration of that later. Um, there are huge infrastructure requirements as well. I mean, if you bought 120,000 um, CPU cores from Intel, you simply wouldn't be able to run them. 
the power usage is in megawatts. Uh, that's a lot. That's what a small town would use. And the yearly electricity bill of Archer is, 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 is counted in the millions of pounds. So these are very, very big systems that require a lot of infrastructure to run. And there's a picture of, of, of um, again, another picture of Archer, um, a big machine. You can get some size, sense of the scale there from somebody standing next to it. And we have a special um, purpose-built supercomputing facility called the Advanced Computing Facility, which is located outside of Edinburgh, uh, where our machines run. And a lot of thought has gone into uh, efficiently operating these systems to keep the electricity bills down. So this, I mean, this is just a picture of what the, 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 the compute node looks like. I'm going to go through the hierarchy. This is just very briefly, very a bit quick to understand, but try and give you some feeling how these machines are built. <coughs> Excuse me. Each compute node on um, Archer is a separate, um, is a separate, effectively separate mini computer, a separate operating system, and it has 24 cores made up of two Intel chips. But Archer is made up of fundamentally about 5,000 individual computers, each of which has 24 processors, which gets us up to 120,000. Each of these is running a copy of Linux. So we're running 5,000 copies of Linux on Archer. Um, the building blocks goes up. Um, we package those um, nodes into blades. And you can see, if you look at that, the blade is the thing that an engineer pulls in and out of the machine. And you'll see there's eight processors there, four nodes. There's another level of chassis. There's another level of group. And that builds up a whole system. So we build up level by level um, to build up a very big system. But it's just to say there's multiple levels of, 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 um, of networking and interconnecting in Archer. And we build up to these very big systems. But the best way to think of Archer is 5,000 individual computers, each of which has 24 processor cores. It's like 5,000 very beefy, very, very powerful desktop machines. But what makes it different from 5,000 desktop machines is they're very closely coupled together. And I have a picture here. Um, it's not actually Archer, it's another system. If you look in the top left, that's what the back of the system looks like, huge cables running everywhere. And then these are artist impressions of what the cabling looks like. This is on a particular, um, uh, on a particular sh uh, what is the terminology? Um, a particular chassis is very closely interconnected. Then we have levels upon levels upon levels of, of, of interconnect. But this is the, the expertise that a manufacturer like Cray brings, able to connect more than 100,000 compute cores together and allow them to communicate very quickly with each other. Just very briefly, what's it used for? This is a snapshot of the UC statistics. Um, a lot of chemistry is done on the machine. Um, that covers a whole a wide range of, of techniques. This is molecular simulations, designing new materials, designing new drugs and such like. A lot of environment, there's a lot of climate research, a lot of engineering, uh, and then and there's physics and, and going down. But it's, it's used by a wide range of computational scientists for a, a wide range of, um, of, of, of systems. If you're interested in what the current hot topics in high performance computing are, what, what, what are the things which are interesting? Well, it's a very exciting time in high performance computing. High performance computers have looked rather similar for about the past 10 years, but they're, they're, they're going into an, a next level where we're starting to explore new technologies. It's a very exciting time. One of the big drivers is that producing a new processor is very expensive, but luckily there's a huge market out there for gaming. Gaming is a massive multi-billion dollar market. And these graphics processors, here's a picture of an Intel, of a NVIDIA Tesla uh, graphics processor, incredibly, um, incredibly efficient. And so people are saying, well, we can use them for doing graphics, but can we use them for doing scientific, for real calculation? And there are techniques for running thousands of threads on each GPU. Now, the challenge here is that if you buy a, a graphics um, if you buy a graphics workstation or you buy a, um, a gaming machine, it might have one or two GPUs in it. Um, this machine, uh, I, if we put GPUs into a supercomputer, we'll have thousands of them. So not only does every thread, does every GPU require thousands of threads, um, each each we need to program thousands of GPUs. So it's an incredibly challenging task. Um, another thing is looking at new programming models. Parallel computers have been programmed relatively similar at least about the past 10 or 20 years. But when we get up to millions of different threads, then we need new techniques. And this, this picture here, which just shows some ants, is, is, 
showing that people are investigating new techniques. So for example, you can use new programming techniques where you do agent-based programming. You imagine that each of your processors, each of your 100,000 processors, is an individual little ant doing some computation on its own and communicating with its neighbors. Um, so you don't program from the top down, you program from the bottom up. And this is maybe this is called agent-based programming. But this, because we're going to these massive scales now with, with potentially hundreds of thousands of millions of processors, people are interested in these new programming techniques. So it's an exciting time to be looking at new ways of programming parallel computers. It's exciting if you're a computer if you've got a computer science background as well. Energy efficiency is a big issue, as you saw. We want to keep the, the power bill down from Archer for two reasons. One is we want to make Archer as efficient as possible, so we want to keep that million pound a year uh, electricity bill low. But also, uh, a data center like the Advanced Computing Facility will have a limited power budget. It might be allowed to say it can take five uh, megawatts from the national grid and no more. So the more power efficient you can make your computing, the more computing you can do for the same amount of power. And the reason I pictured a mobile phone there is that the pioneers in uh, low power technology at the moment are the people de developing um, devices for mobile phones because, of course, we all want our mobile phones to be powerful, but we want them to, to run for a long time on a small battery. So, you know, graphics processors, mobile phone technology, all those kind of things are beginning to be looked at, beginning to be used in high performance computing, so it's a very exciting time. Although Archer itself is, is quite a standard design with a normal standard Intel processors in it, people that we're, we're very interested in what the next generation will be. So just finally, having, having overviewed the sort of current state of high-performance computing, I'll just um, tell you maybe why you might be interested in the MSC and the HPC. Here's a picture of the class who graduated a couple of years ago. We teach all the fundamental tools and techniques to, to program a whole range of parallel computers. As I say, that includes programming anything from your laptop, using all the, the compute cores in your quad-core laptop, up to programming a very large supercomputer. But we also have a a strong focus on robust and high quality software. So we hope that people come out of the, of, the, of the MSC not only able to write parallel software, but also to write generally improved software development skills. As I said, the MSC is offered by the University of Edinburgh. We're part of the University of Edinburgh, so it's a University of Edinburgh degree. Prerequisites, people ask this a lot. The formal prerequisites are a good undergraduate degree in a relevant subject or equivalent work experience. But my real prerequisite is if you're keen on programming. You don't have to be an expert programmer. We teach, we teach you how to program parallel computers. But we, we, we want, if you're not keen on programming, there's no point coming on the MSc, because we do a lot of programming, which I think is fun, and I think our students think is fun. But it, so you, can, you might have done a physics engineering degree. You've done some programming there. You enjoy it. You might want to get better at that. You might have done a computer science degree. We've done a lot of programming. You want to, to develop the parallel computing side. But as I said, the MSc really takes an intake every year from both physical sciences, maths, physics, chemistry, and uh, computer science. As I said, this is just saying that computational science, which is kind of what we teach on the MSc and the HPC, takes the simulation side of physical sciences, that's writing computer programs to do real calculations, not just from, from, from research, but, but in industry and, and, and commerce. And the applied side of computer science, people who are designing new parallel languages, new parallel computing techniques, and brings them together. So you learn from both sides, and we, we bring students together from both sides. Just the curriculum here, we keep it up to date. I mean, what we teach on the MSc, we really try and teach what we what we do at EPCC. So, you know, you'll be taught by people who are, you know, if someone's talking about doing parallel programming and hundreds of thousands of processes, that's what they'll do on Archer. If someone's talking to you about analyzing data, large scale data analytics, then that that we have people working on that day to day. And we've had some notable successes. So last year we had a team from the MSc enter something called the cluster competition at ISC, it's an, at the International Supercomputer Conference in Germany. And our team um, who did this as part of their MSc dissertation um, um, got the top prize for something called the LINPAC benchmark. They got a, a key piece of software running faster on their machine than anyone had ever done before. And that was, that was some of our students. One of the students there on the very left, Manos, um, now works at EPCC. The students used to say to the art facilities, so our students this year who are just coming to the end of the second semester, they all have accounts on Archer, the Cray XC30. We have a local system, Mora, which has just over 100 cores for day-to-day -day development. We've had students have used GPU systems, so we try and keep students up to date. 
um, and use this wide range of systems. What do we teach? Well, we teach parallel programming and performance optimization, software development skills, applied software development skills, how do you write good programs, how do you maintain them, how do you develop them and, and, um, and keep them robust. And we've recently expanded, you'll see we're offering, well, this year and, and for the upcoming year, we're offering two MSCs, one MSC in HPC and one MSC in HPC and data science. And I'll just briefly talk about what um, data science is. Um, to get a, a view of what you can do with all this, the best place to look is the dissertation. So you can look at the, our website there, you can navigate to it, there's the direct URL. You can see what did students do. And students do projects in a wide range of areas, including working with industry. We have half a dozen students each year who work with, with companies to solve their computing problems in parallel. So you can go down a kind of a more research theoretical route or, or take a project which is more applied. What is data science? I got this, I'm not a, um, a data scientist myself, but I got this from a colleague. It's the study of the computational principles, methods, and systems for extracting knowledge from data. Large data sets are now generated by almost every activity in science, society, and commerce, from molecular biology to social media, from sustainable energy to healthcare. And so data science is, trying to, is, is, is the science of analyzing data to come up with, with insight, conclusions, things which are useful. You might ask why is UPCC interested in this? Well, we've been active in this area since actually the mid-90s when it was originally called data mining. There's actually a big spin-out company came from UPCC in the mid-90s to do this commercially. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, so we've been doing this kind of stuff, commercial data mining, genetic analysis, data management for, 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 for a couple of decades. Why is it only now coming into the MSC? Well, the convergence of data science with high performance computing is quite has come recently because the huge data volumes in, in, in these big data applications lend themselves to using high performance computing. If you want to analyze vast amounts of data, you probably need large amounts of computing power. So people are using parallel computing, high performance computing now to do data science, large scale data analysis. So just a couple of promo slides, our students, I think they, they enjoy it. We had a very high satisfaction rating last year. Um, everyone was satisfied and people were very positive about the learning experience and all. What do our graduates do? This is the most interesting. Well, people want to further study. There's PhD positions, some at EPCC, joint with computer science, other ones in math, physics, chemistry, computer engineering. We've had a whole bunch of PhD students do the M uh, sorry, people go on to do PhDs after doing the MSc. There's a, people go through a wide range of co careers in HPC, finance, scientific research, or general software development. People have worked at EPCC. I think about half a dozen or more of our current employees are from EPCC. There's a supercomputing centers. People have worked with in Ireland and, and also in Germany. A number of companies, Boston are a cluster company. Co-player actually are, are games. They develop libraries for games programmers. A few financial institutions, British Aerospace Engineering. A wide range of, of, of careers that our students have gone on to. So actually, that, that was really um, that was all I really had to say. I just wondered if anyone had any questions. It's probably easiest if you have questions, just to type them into the into the chat box. I'm happy to stay around for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I hope you enjoyed, found that useful. The recording of this will be up at the same URL as the, um, what is the deadline? Okay, so um, we continuously take applications uh, all the way up to, um, we can have applications as late as August. Uh, it, the earlier you apply, the better for two reasons. I don't know where you're from, but if you're an overseas student, you have visa issues and such like which need to be sorted out. That needs time, um, but also, we have a number of scholarships available, and I, we typically allocate them sort of May uh, time. So if you apply before then, you're more likely, to, if, if you're eligible for a scholarship, you're more likely to get that. So you know, we take applications continuously, uh, but the earlier you apply, the better. So um, yes, so I didn't mention this, but Archer is, is, is a, in Prace terminology a tier one machine. So a certain component of Archer um, um, is valid, it, it is accessible via Prace. Um, if you, I don't know, are you a student or a researcher, Jana, Jana? Um, I don't know what your, what your um, PhD student, okay. So to get, the way that Archer works is that um, the time is divided up amongst um, a number of large consortia. So there will be a big, and climate research is a single consortium, they'll get time. So if you're doing a PhD 
with a group who's a member of, a, of, of an Archer consortium, then you, you can get time through them. However, yes, you can get time through Praise. We have very recently launched something called the Archer Driving Test. And if you go onto Ar the Archer website, I'll just see if I, no, it's maybe not going to work. I'll just try. Um, the screen might go a bit funny. Oh, right, okay. Right, I'll maybe do it the, um, I'm doing this not not the ideal way, but uh, if you go to the Archer website and if you just, there's a direct link, but if you just search for driving test, you'll see, oh, uh, well, okay, this, but there's the Archer driving test. And the idea here is that anyone can take an online test and what I have on this page and if you get that then you qualify for if you've passed the test successfully you qualify for it's a quite a lot of time it's about 80,000 core hours well, we use a different um, terminology uh, allocation units but it's tens of thousands of hours and you might say, well, how can I pass a, a test about Archer when I don't know anything about Archer? We have an online set of resources here. So you could either come to an introductory course. So we run introductory courses. They're called Hands-On Introduction to High Performance Computing. <coughs> Excuse me. Or you, could, or you could follow these resources. So if you're successful in passing the driving test, you're, you, can, you can then apply for an account, which is something like 80,000 core hours. So there's a lot, the, the, the normal MSc and the data science MSc differ in the, um, for the data science MSc, you do, um, there are two, sp two specific courses, um, one called Fundamentals of Data Management and one called Data Analytics with HPC, which all the data science students do. But there's a large overlap. So the core parallel programming courses will be taken by both communities. But if you're the data scientist, you'll do, uh, uh, first semester course in fundamentals of data management and the second semester course in data analytics. If you're doing the, the non-data science option, you might do a numerical algorithms course in the first semester and then advanced parallel programming or performance optimization. So there is a, there is a big overlap between them um, in terms of the taught part. The thing which differentiates the most is, is in the dissertation. So you know, if you're doing the data science MSc, then you will be doing a dissertation which involves doing data science. But the actual core taught part is quite is, is quite common. So there's um, of the twelve courses, ten are common, and there'll be a difference of two between them. And then there's also options within that. But um, of the core program, there are only two different courses. I don't know if there's any more questions. So I don't quite understand your question. Sorry. Um, there's a module of HPC in the master's tool on computer science. Do you mean the R? Ah, so do you mean that? So okay. So. Ah, okay, fine. So our colleagues in computer science also teach um, um, a uh, a module in high performance computing. So um, that is basically a very a sort of a brief introduction. So there is there isn't. So if you do so, uh, also at Edinburgh, the informatics department run the computer science taught masters. And yes, you can do a module of HPC there. But it's it's it doesn't go into any great it doesn't go into any near as much detail as our MS. So we concentrate entirely on high performance computing, data science, parallel programming. Uh, if you did if you decided to go for the um, the taught masters in computer science, you would have the opportunity to do some of our courses and their module, uh, but you wouldn't go into as much depth. Just to say that um, there are optional modules on our on our actual courses on our program, and, and you can take um, 
courses from the MSc in computer science if you want, and they can take our courses. But yes, they have a separate HPC module, but it's very much um, an introduction to HPC. So there's a number of so I mean um, yes there are the only source of funding is I mean people would self fund but there are scholarships we have scholarships for um, the university offers scholarships they're very competitive but the university offers scholarships which you can apply for we have a couple of scholarships which are open to anybody and there are also some scholarships called um, the, uh, the, the which are offered. Um, to try and encourage people to, to, to work more with, with industry, and you'll see links to those. Um, and I, my, my brain has gone to sleep because they changed the name of them recently. They're called the... Um, um, Universal Life? No, they're, the, the, they're offered by the um, Scottish Funding Council, and they're called the... They used to be called the Fresh Talent Initiative, but they've changed the name. Um, it'll be on the website. <laughs> I should be able to. I'm just going through the. Scholarships for UK EU students. Highly skilled workforce, sorry. Uh, they used to call fresh. The highly skilled workforce scholarships. Uh, we have about half a dozen of them uh, a year, and um, they're they're slightly unusual um, nationality requirements for those. They are open to um, to Scottish students. They were they're funded by the Scottish Funding Council, but that also means they're open to anyone from Europe. But unfortunately, they're they're not available to English students. You need to, well, you need to look at the residency requirements. It's it's uh, they're not the, the the residency requirements are under are under our control. So yeah, so scholarship there are scholarships. I don't. What other source source of funding do you have in mind, Peter? I don't know. Um, there's there's a bunch of different scholarships you can apply for. I didn't. I can't think of any other option that you might have in mind. There are, as you see here, there are post postgraduate tuition fees loans, but again, you need to look at the, um, follow the links to, because some of these have, um, yeah, they're, they're open to EU and, and um, Scottish students, but uh, unfortunately, um, not, um, not English students. So, um, as I said, the best um, the best place to go to look find out at the MSCRR web pages. Um, feel free to send in an email. So we have a dedicated um, course administrator, Crystal, who's very responsive to email. So um, there there will be links on our contact us. Feel free to contact us. Um, there's information here on on the uh, uh, yeah, there's a contact us that should link into uh, yeah. So there's a picture of Crystal. But if you have any questions at all about um, anything, please just uh, you can send an email and Crystal will get back to you. Um, Uh, can I have this frenzy with something similar to Archer next year, second half? So um, I don't. Was the topic was the topic of the session? Uh, Could you involve something? I don't quite understand your question. Are you, are you thinking about doing the? Um, so yes, the dissertations. So the, the dissertation for the MSc start. The MSc is an entire, a complete year, calendar year, as opposed to a. An undergraduate term, which is two semesters. So, so you do two semesters of taught courses, just like a, 
an undergraduate course, then um, uh, then you go to Easter, and after Easter you start on your dissertation. And yes, if you started, uh, you know, there will be we, we we offer a whole way, range of topics of dissertation for students pick from, and because Archer is our what the largest one of the largest computers in the UK, and it's one of our major systems, a lot of the uh, dissertations will 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 use Archer. So we had students this year looking at the network performance on Archer, or looking at performance of of different programs on uh, on Archer. So again, we propose dissertations, but you know, if a student has a particular research interest, and you know, you're here for for five or six months um, before this dissertation starts, so you can chat to members of staff and suggest your own topic or or discuss something. So, so yes, Archer is a key uh, one of the key platforms for for students who want to do their dissertation. So, it, it, uh, uh, if you're doing a dissertation, yeah. Okay, so um, I think some slight technical issues here, but um, okay, so I hope that was okay. So um, placement statistics. What you should do is e uh, we have a, a list of the of the destination and such like. So the best thing to do would be just to email in, uh, go to the contact us website. People ask, ask this quite a lot, so we have a we have a list. So if you email in, and um, Crystal will get back to you with that. So just send an email. As I said, I have some general uh, stats there, that's just sort of distribution. But but um, I mean, I think that broadly, about a third of our students go on to do PhDs. A third go on to do um, to work in, in in companies just doing general computing, and a third go into sort of um, software development, high performance computing in sort of other other areas. So it's a, it, but oh, but Crystal will have Crystal is the person to, to speak to. She has she has the statistics. So if you just send an email and we can get back to you on that. Okay, to prepare so. People ask this. We teach OpenMP, MPI. I mean, I always say two things when people ask. The first thing is that um, uh, we the, we assume you can program in, in some language. Maybe you can program in Java, Python, or whatever, which is good. But um, the MSC, the, the, the HPC programming models like OpenMP and MPI, currently are only really supported in in two languages. Fortran or C and C++. So the best thing to do um, beforehand is, if you're if you know Fortran or if you know C and C++, then just to practice your general programming in those in those areas. If you don't know those languages, you might want to look at, at learning them in advance. Um, but I think it's it's um, there's a lot of online resources um, for these things. But but we don't assume we don't assume you've done any um, OpenMP or MPI, but we do assume that you that you have um, good programming skills, so that's really something to brush up on. Um, in particular, programming in the sort of um, um, uh, yeah, to, to, just just general programming skills is, is to, to brush up on. But we take a wide, a diverse intake of students, and we have a very uh, high completion rate. And so, students, we've not had any. Problems in the past with students coming on the course and, and not having that. I mean, we look very carefully at the applications. So the the fundamental thing is is uh, is being keen on programming and having some programming skills. If you want to learn a bit of C, C plus plus, four child, brush up on advanced. That would be the best thing to do. Okay, so I actually have to go in a minute or so. I can maybe take one more question if there was a question, but. 
If not, then I would I'd propose to wrap up. Just to say that if you if you have people who you, um, you think might be interested in this in this um, presentation but can't attend, if the recording has worked correctly, um, then we will um, uh, we will put a recording up on the website. Right, cover HPC hardware. Yes, so there's a there's a first semester co course called HPC Architectures, which talks about how processors interconnect and, and things fit together, and we do a lot on. Um, if you do the more advanced courses such as performance optimization and, and such like, we go into detail. So we teach the aspects of computer hardware which are relevant for HPC and, and that includes processor technology, interconnect technology, but also the way that memory systems work. I don't know if people know, but the way that, that memory works on modern computers is A, very complicated, but B, crucial to performance. So if you understand how modern memory systems work, caches and, and, and other such like things, you can make your programs go much faster. So yes, we cover HPC hardware. We we cover it in as much as what do you need to know about HPC hardware to, to write the best parallel programs. So it's not the fundamental aim of the course, but we teach it because you need to understand HPC hardware to write efficient parallel programs, programs that perform efficiently, that run fast. Okay, so I do have to go now, um, but as I said, a recording of this lecture should be up on the website. Where there's the current um, join link, there will be a C recording link. Thanks, everyone. I hope seeing the technology went reasonably well, so, so goodbye, everyone. Have a, thanks for attending.